Welcome to discipleship cl uh, class. I think it's number nine. Yes, sir. All right, number nine. All right, I just want to let people know this. That way, in the future, if they're like wondering what's the homework assignment, they get worried. My best advice is this. Before the next discipleship class starts, look at the previous discipleship video. If you look at the previous discipleship video, at the end, okay, so that's what happened. Usually at the end of the video, I post a homework assignment. You'll usually see a screen there. So after the discipleship video is done, you'll see like a blank white screen and it'll give you like your homework assignment, which ones to listen to. Now, if you don't see that blank screen at the end of the discipleship video, just listen to the last part of the discipleship video. Usually, I close the class with a homework assignment. I will tell you what the homework assignment is. So just pay attention to those and you should be able to get it. All right, so what we're going to do is that if you watch those, or not watch, if you listen to those audios, here are the basic doctrines that you would have listened to. So let's start off first with inspiration and preservation. So that was the first one, inspiration and preservation. So, in the inspiration and preservation video, inspiration means God breathed. That's what it means. It means God breathed. God breathed into the scriptures. So, I gave you a verse on that, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. It, uh, it says right here, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So it says all scripture. So meaning all parts of the scripture is God breathed. That means that nothing in our Bible today is missing God's inspiration, God breathed. So we know that we have the perfect pure words of God in our hand, why? Because all scripture is God breathed. Now there are critics who deny this. They say only the originals are inspired. So they will insist that it's originals, not copies. So the, this is not true. Now, the reason why they say that is because they don't want to believe that the current copy of your Bible you have in your hand is inspired. They think only the original, the first writing of the apostles and prophets, that's only God breathed. But after that, there were mistakes and imperfections. Well, there were corruptions, but that doesn't mean God was weak to protect his inspired words. So the proof and the evidence of copies, I gave you several verses on that. So the verses that I showed to you was, uh, one of them was Luke chapter 4, verse 17 through 19. The other one was Acts chapter 8 and verse 30. So in those two verses in the audio, you've heard that Jesus had... Uh, the book of Isaiah, and the Ethiopian eunuch had the book of Isaiah, and they're both called scripture. Remember, all scripture is God-breathed. Now, wait a minute. Uh, I thought that Jesus had the original copy at Luke 4, but no, it turned out the Ethiopian eunuch must have had the original copy of Isaiah at Acts 8. So unless that uh, it miraculously jumped from Palestine to Africa, or those two were copies, see? So that proves copies were inspired, or are inspired, excuse me. I also gave you Exodus chapter 34, verse 1, and Jeremiah 36. Those two chapters prove that it's uh, God had to make a new set of the Ten Commandments. Jeremiah 36, uh, they burned the original scroll, they had to make a new scroll after that. Now, here's the favorite one. The best one was Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 1. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 1. In that passage, it said that the men of Hezekiah wrote, are writing this chapter, this chapter of Proverbs 25, a copy. That's what it specifically said. So, the original Proverbs 25, or so-called original, is actually a copy. I also showed you sev uh, several more passages. A really good one 
was 2 Timothy 3, 15. Verse 16 said all scripture is given by inspiration, but the verse behind it, verse 15, showed it was definitely a copy because Timothy as a young child had the scriptures. How did he have that? Did he have the original? No, of course not. Now remember, I'm just briefly reviewing through the basic doctrines, so that's why this is going to be really fast. If you all watch the audio studies and wrote all the verses, then all you have to do is skim through your notes and make sure that you wrote everything right. That's it. I also showed you more verses that prove that it's copies, not originals. Several examples include uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the Bereans, Apollos, Acts chapter 18, and verse 28. So the, I gave you numerous passages to defend the copies. Now, preservation. Okay, so we talked about inspiration here. Now let's talk about preservation. The famous passage is Psalms 12, 6 through 7. This one you definitely should remember in the future. It's a famous passage always used. It's a basic. That's why this is basic doctrine classes. Discipleship for beginners. So the words of the Lord are pure words. Purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So those verses, words, every single word, not just uh, picking and choosing words. Words, plural, are preserved. Preserved means kept safe. So these verses prove that we have to have every word of God today because God preserved them. I also gave you Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. And then 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 and 25. Because those verses showed that uh, the word of God stands forever, forever, forever. Forever is used in nearly all those verses. I also mentioned Psalms chapter 119 and verse 89. The words are preserved forever in heaven. I also mentioned Matthew chapter 24, verse 35 that heaven and earth shall pass away, but God's words will not pass away. Now, some of the critics, I don't know if I mentioned this in the audio, but just in case, for Psalms 12, 6, and 7, it says, Thou shalt keep them, preserve them, right? Preserve them. So we insist that them is the words. But the scholars, they claim that the le them is not referring to words. It's referring... Uh, to the righteous, the righteous people. That's what they will claim. Now, the reason why that they will claim that is because in them, it's referred to as a masculine gender. That's what I mentioned. It's not a neuter. It's in a masculine gender. So thus, words shouldn't fit in. It should be a neuter form. Since it's masculine, it must prove that it's persons. But the easy debunking to that, which I mentioned to you, is that the Holy Spirit, who's a person, is referred to a neuter form. Jesus, when he was born, he was called that holy thing, neuter form, not a masculine form. Now, why is that? The reason why is if you know not just one language, but different languages, so you should know better if you know Greek and Hebrew. You know from personal experience that duality, different languages, sometimes they will take a thing and attribute that with a masculine gender or a feminine gender or a neuter gender. See? Same thing with a person. Sometimes they'll take a person and refer that to a neuter gender. That's very common in Greek. In fact, the word child, technon, is referred to as a neuter gender. So I took Greek class for three years and even wrote a 60-page Greek critique on Kenneth West's commentary. So that should be just a basic for everybody. Now, I also mentioned about double inspiration here. Now, double inspiration, they accuse Bible believers for teaching double inspiration. In other words, that God had to, well, excuse me, let me say it this way. The King James Bible is a brand new inspiration from God. Thus, the originals inspired and the King James Bible inspired. Thus, double inspiration. Now, that is completely bogus. Uh, we, we're not saying that the King James Bible is a brand new inspiration. We believe that it's preserved, preserving the inspiration. But 
in order to answer against these critics about double inspiration, it's really simple. I mentioned to you Jeremiah 36. That is the greatest evidence. Jeremiah 36, you know what it showed? It mentioned that when Jeremiah got rid of the first scroll, he made a brand new scroll of God's word, double inspiration. But not only that, this double inspiration is proven because they added new words. See that? You talk about double inspiration right there. That's actually biblical, believe it or not. Not only that, the easiest evidence is the New Testament. Look at every New Testament verse that quotes the Old Testament. Do you realize not all the words are the same? So there are changes, see that? So that's double inspiration right there. So the evidence is really great right there. 51 are from the Hebrew Pentateuch, 46 from the Kethubim, and 61 from the Nabim. So those are the Hebrew Old Testament. So that's a total, uh, well, I, I can't calculate, yeah, a total of 158. Didn't you know that? 158 verses. Double inspiration. What are you going to do with that? Now, the critics, what they will claim to do is that they will use 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. So they will say, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So they will use this as proof that... Uh, the writers were inspired by God. Thus, copies or later inspiration could not be inspired. So they will say, oh, so you're saying that the KGB translators were inspired. That's why your King James Bible is inspired. But no, that don't make sense. The Bible says, 2 Peter 1.21, only the apostles, the prophets who wrote the originals are inspired. Thus, the King James Bible is not inspired, only the originals. But that argument falls apart because I told you in that teaching that um, the, verse said, uh, the verse only said what the prophets said were moved by the Holy Ghost, not the prophets themselves. Because if you insist that what the person themselves is inspired, then what about Paul's letter to Laodicea? That's mentioned at the book of Colossians 4.16. What about Solomon's 3,000 Proverbs and 1,005 songs that are not in our Bible? 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32. Not only that, what about your book of Romans that talks about saved by faith, not works? Paul didn't write that. It was Tertius who wrote it. <laughs> Romans 16, 22. See? So that argument falls apart. So it shows right here what matters is what is said. See? That's retained. It's not the person themselves. So we're not saying that the KJV translators are inspired, thus the King James Bible is inspired. It's what's said that you see in the paper, what's said. And that's what's always been argued, the Word of God, Word of God, what is said, what is said, Word of God, Word of God. That's inspired. Okay, so let's talk about um, the creation of man right here. So that was inspiration and preservation. Now we're going to talk about um, the creation of man. Oh, don't give up the ghost yet. <laughs> so I don't know if this ink is going to give up the ghost yet. We'll see. The creation of man. Okay, so creation, creation. So I mentioned to you that, first of all, that um, God is the one who created man. That was the first point right there. That God created man. And then I mentioned to you Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. And I also mentioned about Genesis 2, 22. Uh, God created man out of the dust of the ground. And then he created woman out of the rib of man. Now this one's the important part right here. Is that um, God created man in his own image. So that was the next point. God created man in his own image. Now, what is very important about that teaching about God creating man in his own image, which is mentioned at uh, the book of Genesis, what we're going to find out is that man was made in the image of God, and the image of God is said to be Jesus Christ. And then I mentioned these verses. 
2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Colossians 1.15, as well as Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through, two, uh, 1 through 3. Jesus is in the image of God. Now, why did I mention this part? Because what you're going to find out is this teaching, that man lost the image of God. That is very important to understand. So a false teaching going around is that we're all in God's image. That's not true. You got to realize this, is that uh, mankind has lost the image of God. Now, we would, all, we would always mention, I'm sure you heard in my previous teachings, that when man was created, he's created in the image of God. But this is a past tense, see, whenever I teach that. Whenever I talk about that, I mean that as a past tense. We lost it now. Man now is in his own image, image of Adam. This is uh, proven at Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3. Genesis 5, 3. That's an important verse. It says that when Adam's children were born, they were not made in the image of God. They're made in the image of Adam. Only saved men are in the image of God. Only saved men are in the image of God. And that's proven at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter, uh, excuse me, Colossians 3.10. That's right, Colossians 3.10. Colossians 3.10 shows that until you get saved, then you're in the image of God. But not only that, uh, if you looked at 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, which I mentioned that Jesus Christ is the image of God, it shows when you receive the gospel, see, that's the image of God. Thus, when you get saved by the gospel, you're made in the image of God once more. I also mentioned that uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, because man was, past tense, made in the image of God, God takes life very seriously. That's why there's capital punishment. So capital punishment was ordained because of that. Now, I also mentioned this. This is another important teaching. And it's amazing that even advanced, and I mean advanced Bible believers, miss out this basic doctrine. This is a basic doctrine. Woman is made in the uh, image of man. And that's 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7. Woman is made in the image of man, not in the image of God. But when woman and man get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're both made in the image of God. Now, God created man with a tripartite being, all right? That's the third point. God created man with a tripartite being. So, in other words, man has three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And then I mentioned the verses to prove that. I mentioned that man, that... Uh, he was cre how he was created at Genesis 2-7. He was made out of the dust of the ground, body. God breathed into his nostril, spirit, and man became a living soul, soul, Genesis 2, verse 7. Thus he was created with three parts. 1 Thessalonians 5-23 definitely proves man has three parts. 1 Thessalonians 5-23 proves that man definitely has three parts. Another point that I mention is that God created man to be in control of the environment. So, uh, being an environmentalist, you gotta understand about you know raising up animals, taking, spending so much money and time on animals and nature, more than children. So they would res they would rescue some dogs and some pigs, but and some extinct species, but they don't hesitate to abort a baby, huh? So these kind of people actually are actually definitely out of God's will. Genesis 1, verse 28 through 29, it says man is to be in dominion, dominion over the earth and over all of God's creatures. So we're supposed to rule over the environment, not share. So that's the thing. We're supposed to be the dominant authoritative figure, not let the animals, you know, uh, not share with them and let them take half of the control. No, we don't do that. See, uh, Genesis chapter 9 also proved that even after the flood, God repeated the command again that you're supposed to be in dominion over the world. In fact, he took this dominion so seriously that he even said you can even eat uh, the animals. You can even eat them. So he took that seriously. All right, another point right here is that God created man with free will. Man has free will. 
so that is a basic doctrine. <laughs> Calvinists definitely do not like this teaching. So, this is proven at Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 through 17. Notice that at the creation of man, God gave man a choice to partake in the tree or not to partake in the tree. See that? So man was created with free choice. I also gave you two more verses, Joshua 24, verse 15, and 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, proving that man definitely has free will and they're not overrun like a robot by God. Not only that, God created man with intelligence. That was another thing that I taught you. God created man with intelligence. So man, it has they have knowledge. That's what makes us different from uh, animals and nature is that we have an intelligence that is far more advanced than all the other creatures. This is proven at Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, where man had the ability to name and remember the animals. Man also had knowledge of good and evil, uh, Genesis 2, verse 17 and verse 22. They had the ability to know good and evil. And that is definitely proven after they uh, partook at uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not only that, uh, an important one is Colossians 3.10. Man has knowledge of spiritual things after salvation. That's a very important thing. We do have knowledge of spiritual things. For people to say, oh, it's mystic, relative, you'll never know, that's a lie. God created man to be with, to not be alone, okay? to not be alone with fellow men. So that's very important to understand is that a lot of online people, that's why it's important for you to understand you can't be alone. When God created you, it was a basic natural thing to be around people. Don't just stay stuck in front of your computers all day. Genesis 2.18 proves that God says that it wasn't good for man to be alone. And then uh, I gave you verses to prove it. Um, Hebrews 10, 25, proved that God demanded not to forsake the fellowship. And then I also mentioned Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. I think that's wrong. It should be 2:28, But it shows right there that God created animals where man shouldn't be alone. But in case Genesis 1, 28, 1, 28, it shows that one human can have many others with them. All right, the last point in this teaching was that God created man with immortality, immortality. So when God created you, he did not create you to die. That's extremely important to understand. He intended for all of us to live forever. But because of man's free choice, uh, man chose to die instead. Revelation 4 verse 11 proved that God wanted men to live eternally. Why? He created us to worship him to give glory to God for all eternity. And then I mentioned uh, three passages. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, the spirit goes to God. Matthew 25, 46, the soul goes to heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 54, the body will be resurrected. Thus, truly saved people in Jesus Christ are made immortal. All right, the next teaching that I taught you was the church, the church. Now, church, what's extremely important to understand, this is a basic that you all should know, okay? This is extremely important, a basic you should know. Church came from a word, ecclesia, ecclesia, okay? E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, -E -S -I -A, ecclesia. Church means called out assembly, called out assembly. That is a basic to understand. So church does not mean a building. It means a group of people who's called out by the Lord. So that's the origin of the church. So in our teaching on the church, I'll just put a dividing line here. Whoa, okay. In our teaching on the church, It came from the Greek word ekklesia, which is called out assembly. Now, another Greek word that I taught you is kuriakon, and that means belonging to the Lord. So that's another Greek word you'll see in reference to the church. Now, there are references to the church. Now, this one's the most important point, okay? 
Because in your basic doctrine teaching, when you see these words in the Bible, then you'll know that it's that it means the church or it's referring to the church. Now here are the names of the church you really want to know, which I hope you really did write down in the audio. So remember, I'm going through this fast because this is just reviewing. So if you're all writing it right now, then uh, you got to make sure you listen to the audios first so that you don't get lost. Okay, one of them was assembly called out by God. That was Acts 7, 37 through 38. Building, that was 1 Corinthians 11, 18 and Acts 19, 37. Now remember, I mentioned to you that church is not a building. It's a called out assembly. But you'll see minuscule cases where the church is a building, actually. So that's one important to understand. So don't think that church means only called out assembly, okay? Most of the time it is, but there are minuscule time that it is a building as well. So don't get all technical like advanced Bible believers saying, oh, it's not right to call yourself a church. San Jose Bible Baptist Church. A church is a called out assembly, not a building. Well, there are some verses that show it can be a building. 1 Corinthians 11, 18, Acts 19, 37. Okay? Now, if we Bible believers argue that the church is a called out assembly, we're only saying that because a lot, the majority of Christians mistakenly think that the church is only a building. But no, God says it's a called out assembly. So you don't need a building on that. Oh, welcome to the house of the Lord. You know, welcome to the church, they would piously state. But no, that it's not supposed to be a building. The curtains, the nice sheets and all that. God is in the hearts of believers, the bodies of believer. Okay, anyway. All saved Christians, all saved Christians, 1 Corinthians 10.32. The body of Christ, Ephesians 1, 22 through 23. A local church, Acts 20, verse 17, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 2, 1 Thessalonians 1, 1. A spiritual building, that's number 6. Matthew 16, 18, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. And a bride of Christ, the bride of Christ, Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. So this is a basic you must know. Because whenever you read your Bible, you'll find these words. And then you'll know it's referring to the church. Okay, now, anyways, distinctions of the church. Now, this one's also really important to understand, okay? When we talk about church, there are several categories. I am going to use a new pen after this video. <laughs> For now, y'all bear with me on this one. Distinctions of the church. There are four categories, okay? I mentioned to you the invisible church, which is referring to all saved Christians, and a visible church, which is referring to Christians who are members in a church. And then I mentioned the local church and the universal church as the second distinction. The local church is a local congregation in a church. The universal church is all congregations uh, everywhere. Uh, the third distinction was an actual church and an ideal church. The actual church is those who are, uh, excuse me, those who are perfect and in heaven with Christ. Those who are perfect and in heaven in Christ. So that's the actual church. The ideal church is down here. People who are imperfect yet striving for perfection. Now, the fourth distinction was the church militant and the church triumphant. The church militant is the church on earth because we're like a military. We're battling the gates of hell. The church triumphant is the one who already got the victory and they're in heaven. That's why Savonarola, he gave this quote. Uh, the Catholic Church put a crucifix in front of him and they told him, I separate thee from the church of Rome. And Savonarola, he retorted back to them, the church militant, yes, the church triumphant, no. Now, a lot of people don't get a blessing out of that because they don't even know what that means. So this is the basic doctrine you should know. Church militant, what Savonarola meant was the church down here. The church triumphant was the church in heaven. So basically, Savonarola was saying when the Catholic Church said, I separate you from the church of Rome, Savonarola would say, you can separate me from the church down here, but you can't separate me from the church up there. Woo! Glory, right? But you see, you wouldn't get a blessing out of that if you're not being discipled and you know basic stuff. So this is important to understand. All right. The founding of the church. All right, that's the fourth point. 
The founding of the church is not the Pope. It's not Simon, Simon Peter. Okay? It's Jesus Christ. That I gave you Matthew 16, 16 through 18, John 2, 19 through 21, and 1 Peter 2, 5 through 8. Now, what's important about those three passages is that it shows you Peter is not the rock, the foundation of the church. Because if you compare that with John 2 and 1 Peter 2, it shows that the rock has to be Jesus Christ. Okay, This rock was referring to Jesus pointing himself as the rock at Matthew 16. All right, so I'm not going to explain that. The founding of the church, it was made possible by the cross, Ephesians 2.16, Ephesians 2.16. So we highly disagree with the heresy called mid-acts. They're also known as hyper-dispensationalist or grace churches. They believe the church started um, at the middle of Acts. We fully deny that. We believe that the church, it was able to start at Ephesians 2 by the cross. That's when the church started, at the cross. And then officially, outwardly, where you can see it started, uh, was Acts chapter 2, Acts 2. It started at Pentecost, at Acts 2. Acts 2 is what we believe was what started the church. Okay, it doesn't go beyond that. Now, the purpose of the church. Okay, now this one is a basic. Every Bible believer says this, okay? Whenever you go to a church, you have to see three things here. And this one is a basic you all should know. Evangelizing the sinner, Acts 2.47. Edifying the saint, Ephesians 4.11-12. Exalting the Savior, Ephesians 3.21. That's a basic in every church. And then the last point I mentioned was the history of the church. Now this part should be encouraging to you because I was showing you what a typical church is like. People think that when they go to a small church, they easily get discouraged. People leaving church, they get discouraged. They see people betraying one another in church, they get easily discouraged. You're not, you don't know a basic doctrine, all right? I don't want you to get bitter and mad when you go to a Bible-believing church. What you got to understand is this. The history of the church has always been smallness, betrayal, uh, loneliness, and problems after problems. People fight, fighting, fussing with each other. People turning against the pastor. That's normal. That's always been the history of the church, you got to understand. I gave you four pastors as a great example to encourage you. One example was Noah. He only had seven people out of the whole world, and he preached over a hundred years. Now, wouldn't you get discouraged after that? <laughs> Abraham. Uh, he was supposed to go alone, but his family came with him. But what happened? His member became a worldly, incestual pedophile. <laughs> In Genesis 12 uh, worldly uh, if not a pedophile because his daughters must have been grown up that time he might he committed incest see so you talk about discouragement right there he left out of the country and started his own group of people lot became one of the worst church members Moses Moses he had two million members okay even pastors of large churches have it extremely difficult you gotta understand so don't bash pastors with large churches. You've got to understand that in their case, it's extremely difficult too. Pastors of large churches. He had two million members, so he, his wife was criticized. Do you see that in churches? They'll criticize the pastor's wife. He, uh, people were sinning and complaining when the pastor was absent. Don't you see that happening in churches? Uh, lack of trust in the pastor... So you will have people inside, on the inside, trying to take over the pastor's position. We saw that. And not only that, the pastor even backslides. The pastor even messes up. Why? Because of anger against his own church members. So sometimes you'll see the pastor, when he preaches a sermon, he'll get in the flesh and just slam on somebody deliberately. Why? Not that you can really blame him for that. It's because of that stupid church member's fault. So you can't get hard on your pastors. You've got to be totally understanding of that. Now, the reason why I'm emphasizing this a lot is that when you people online go to these Bible-believing churches, I don't want you to... Uh, you would be... I don't want the name of San Jose Bible Baptist Church where we were a blessing in your life, and I don't want those pastors 
to think that San Jose Bible Baptist Church has a bad name of sending rebels and troublemakers into their churches. Now, pastors and everybody are imperfect. I stress that over and over again. So you'll see pastors backsliding, you gotta understand. Jesus, didn't you know even he had it rough as a church? He should be your greatest encouragement. And Jesus, um, he had 70 people originally, then he dropped to 12. And one of them uh, was in, one of them was an infidel, his right hand man, cussed and swore in front of the lost people and his treasurer was a devil church treasurer with the money wow you talk about rough all right the last one is heaven heaven this one was uh, probably the greatest blessing you heard this teaching you got to get your mind out of the world man so many worldly minded christians they ought to say i want to go to heaven not stay in the world now the orig origin of heaven it was created in the beginning. It will last forever. It's a prepared place for prepared people. It's not man-made, uh, but God-made. God lives there, and heaven has buildings. It's not just clouds like people mistakenly think. I also mentioned to you the names of heaven, the names of heaven. And they're mentioned at these following verses, okay? So I'm not going to... I mentioned the names here, but I mentioned many different names in heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, 2, Matthew 3, 12, Ephesians 5, 5, John 14, 2, Hebrews 4, 9, and 2 Corinthians 12, 4. So if there's any of those verses that you missed out as you're looking through your notes, uh, you want to make that note down. Okay, so those are all the different names of heaven. So whenever you see this certain name in the Bible, you'll know it's referring to heaven. All right, the size of heaven, the size of heaven. So I mentioned to you that it is immeasurable. But then I mentioned that there was another part. So this is a part of heaven, okay, that was measurable. And that's New Jerusalem. It's approximately 1,200 miles by length, width, and height. And it's going to be like a double pyramid. And statistics is this. Statistics is uh, 100 million dying each year. Uh, Excuse me, no, the size, this size can fit at a rate of 100 million people dying each year from Acts chapter 2 till even now. Each person will have enough of having 10 rooms, 10 feet square out of solid gold. So it shows that it should have enough, more than enough room, more than enough room. What heaven is like, what heaven is like. So what's heaven like? So I mentioned to you what heaven is like. Basically, that it's high, it's holy without, uh, very high, okay, up there. It's holy without sin, it's without night or darkness, no more hunger, thirst, or excessive heat, uh, nor sun rays, because Jesus is the light, as I taught you. The curse of sin is gone, and uh, also that there is satisfaction and pleasure for Christians in heaven. So think about, uh, it's, it's sad that so many people want to turn to the bottle to get to feel that satisfaction and pleasure. Uh, turn to fornication for satisfaction and pleasure. But you got to understand this, is that that kind of feeling is forever up in heaven, you got to understand. So it's going to be a great place. See, heaven is truly paradise bliss. I also mentioned Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, and that verse is the number one best verse, Revelation 21, verse 4, that gives everything about heaven, gives everything about heaven. Now, here's another thing. Uh, in heaven, you also have a chance to rule over angels. Now, that's something, man. Telling Gabriel what to do and Michael the archangel. Do you know how they can smash us to pieces like really quickly right now? Not only that, we're going to rule over nations. We're going to rule over nations. Man, this is a paradise. Now, what heaven look like, uh, what heaven looks like, the appearance of heaven. What does heaven look like? What does heaven look like? That's the next section that I talked about. It is ornamented with all kinds of jewels. It contains mansions. And I don't mean apartment rooms. I mean mansions. That should be a blessing. It has a crystal river, it has streets of gold, it has a tree bearing 12 kinds of fruits, 
for healing. It also have 12 gates of pearl. It also has a perfect rainbow. You understand this. We, in our earth, there's no such thing as a perfect rainbow. It's a half bow. But a perfect rainbow, we'll see it up in heaven. Bodies in heaven. Now, this was really interesting right here. That's the next section. Bodies in heaven. Now, that was extremely interesting right here. The main passages to show it, would the most important one would be Joel chapter 2. That would be the most important passage to show the description of what kind of body you have. But basically, your body in heaven, so, man, you feel like shouting after this. Your body will have zero lust of sin. It will never want to sin again. So imagine doing whatever you wanted, whatever you wanted to do, and it's not sin. It's not considered sin. That would be a blessing, won't it? So that's the kind of body you'll have. It will have a glory of certain glows. So your body is going to have certain glows up in heaven. Your body will also have power. And in Joel 2, it's basically a combination. Now, the world tries to depict it, depict it in movies, right? But it's only a fantasy genre. So I'm only going to mention these worldly parts so that you can understand. So basically, like Superman, Matrix, and DBZ, if you combine all three of that together, of those kind of bodies, you see that at Joel chapter 2. That is your body. You talk about literally out of sight, man. <laughs> and then uh, you have the body of Jesus Christ. Now, these two verses are a basic, a basic. Philippians 3.21 and 1 John 3.2. Everyone knows this, that your body will be transformed into the body of Jesus Christ. And when you have the body of God, that should solve all your problems, don't you think? And the body, the body you'll have is basically the mind of Jesus Christ. Now that should blow your mind. If you have the mind of Jesus Christ, you have a brain smarter than Einstein and all the intellects. High IQ. Now... The last section, what's in heaven? What's in heaven? Oh my goodness, friend. What's in heaven? So much great things. What's in heaven? It is basically perfect fellowship. You're going to see that all over. You're going to see God. There's going to be Jesus, angels, Old Testament saints, our departed loved ones, no sinners or criminals or people hurting you or jerks. Now, that's going to be a blessing. Uh, no Satan. Woo, that's a bigger blessing. Supernatural creatures. And it's going to be awesome. Movies try to depict these weird hybrid creatures. But you got to understand this, is that those things are all demonic and strange because it's depicted from the mind of man. When the mind of God, it's pure and holy, the, those supernatural creatures. You see Jesus face to face. So that's the best part in heaven, obviously, is that you see Jesus' face no matter what. And then uh, basically the last part, 1 Corinthians, whoa, okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, the half has not been told. So that's probably the most important verse in your entire Bible, is that the half has not even yet been told at 1 Corinthians 2, 9. So that's gr how awesome heaven will be. Okay, so your next homework assignment uh, for discipleship, your next homework assignment, and I will post it online, it will be the intercession of Christ. It will also be deity and personality of Holy Spirit, quiet time, as well as the devil, the devil, and they will be posted online for you. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this 
is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.